recognize many of your voices and faces. Um, I'm just going to go over a few logistics before we dive into the great, uh, the great session we have planned for today. Um, we are joined by, you know, over 100 people now, still see people logging in, and again, really thrilled that you can be with us today. We have three sessions. Um, first, a conversation about the value and vision of credential transparency. Second, a panel about how this work can support equity goals. And we'll end with a panel about state policy related to credential transparency. Just a couple of housekeeping items. This is a large group, so everyone will be kept on mute, but we encourage you to use the Q&A box to ask questions. We'll be monitoring those questions and answering them throughout. And we'll also have um, an audience Q&A component at the end of each session. So please feel free to add questions for our panelists and speakers throughout their sessions. We'll make sure that we get them answered um, throughout the day. And we also encourage you to bring this conversation to social media as well, using the hashtag Partners in Transparency on Twitter. Um, and also keep your eye on the chat. We'll be pasting links to relevant documents and resources throughout the event. Um, also just quickly wanna mention that if you do use the chat, it defaults to sending directly to us panelists, which you're more than welcome to do. But if you want to send a message to everyone or introduce yourself in the chat, um, make sure that it's set to send to panelists and attendees both. Um, as you saw, we are recording this convening and we'll send this convening recording and any of the materials we mentioned to all of the participants after the event. And with that housekeeping out of the way, I will officially turn this over to Scott Cheney, Credential Engine CEO, to kick us off. Thank you, Emily. Thank you very much. And uh, very much appreciate everybody joining us today. We are thrilled to have so many people uh, who have been following our work and have been interested in participating in this. We do have a growing network of partners who have been working on this collective effort to improve open information about our education and occupational credentials marketplace since our launch just about four years ago. And I've been very happy to have a chance to work with so many of you who are on the call today and hope to get a work, uh, chance to work with the rest of you uh, that we may not have had a chance to yet. We do all this work because when there are nearly a million unique credentials available in the United States alone, offered by somewhere around 50,000 different providers with many vastly differing quality frameworks and performance standards, it's critically important that students and workers, employers, policymakers, parents, counselors, and others have access to comprehensive, actionable information to make the most informed decisions about which credentials from which providers will actually meet their, their needs best. And while that's still not fully possible today, great progress has been and is still being made. And we honestly have all of you to thank for that. This is not credential engines rock to push up the hill. We are certainly coordinating a lot of this. We're leading with some key technologies. But this is a big collective community effort, and we can't thank you enough for all of the work you're doing. Nearly half the states, several regions, and a collection of states through compacts in two of our, our four compacts around the country have been leading this work to realize credential transparency. Many secondary and post-secondary education and training systems and institutions are working on their own to make that information available as well. Federal agencies are putting in place important policies and supportive language to help push this agenda forward. Foundations are emphasizing linked, open, and interoperable data more and more. We're going to hear today from a whole variety of experts about the work they're doing on these fronts, both at the state and the national level through advocacy organizations, from foundations and many others. So I wanna make sure that you hear as much from them as you can and less from me. So I'm gonna move us on right away to our first panel session today. 
This panel is gonna provide both a look back to our early days and a look forward to the value and role of credential transparency and open data about the vast and confusing marketplace of credentials, competencies, providers, pathways, and their links to occupational skills and jobs. Our two guests for this first panel are Ted Mitchell, president of the American Council on Education, a Credential Engine board member, and a panelist at our launch event four years ago in December of 2027. And joining Ted is Nicole Eiffel, Senior Program Officer at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, where she's a lead on the foundation's work around open and interoperable data, and a grant officer on the foundation's support for open data and credential transparency. So I'm gonna ask Ted to kick us off and to have a conversation with Nicole for a while, and then we'll move to some Q&A with them. Thank you, Ted. Thank you, Scott, and uh, great to see everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, this is uh, important work, and we're uh, going to make progress in that work if we continue to work together. And I wanna uh, give a shout out to Scott and the team uh, for really starting from ground zero and building uh, in uh, literally an engine uh, by which uh, transparency uh, and uh, reliability have become uh, uh, resident in the in the credentialing space. Um, so Scott asked me to talk a little bit about um, the then and now. Uh, Scott's right. Uh, I was at the the initial the initial launch, the convening. Uh, it wasn't 2027, Scott. That's that's a little little um, optimistic, uh, but we'll get there. We'll get there. Uh, but when we got together, um, it really was a bet on the ability of this uh, not-for-profit uh, supported by a lot of uh, important and influential funders and institutions uh, to really begin to bring some sensibility into what is uh, what was even then a really vibrant uh, credentialing market. Uh, so, so let me let me um, talk a little bit about about my own journey from that moment till now. Uh, I joined ACE really months before uh, the credential engine launch, uh, and I came to ACE actually with one of my uh, one of my marching orders uh, to, to help position the American Council on Education as something uh, broader than the American Council on Traditional Institutional Higher Education, uh, if, you, if you get the distinction. And so we spent a lot of time at ACE thinking about how to, how to position uh, uh, ourselves and realized very early on uh, that there was a, a, a real risk of trying to boil the ocean. And I think that that's one of the things that lots of people who looked at the grid credentialing space uh, thought. And so we turned uh, uh, to Credential Engine as a core and key partner in helping to build uh, transparency and reliability, as I mentioned, uh, into the system. Why is that important? It's important for two reasons. First, it's important because uh, there is an explosion and, and, and Nicole will talk a little bit more about this later. There is an explosion across the country uh, of uh, credentials, badges, certificates of a variety of kinds, uh, and a variety of different ways that we can locate those as learners, as employers, um, but very little crosstalk between them, very little set of, very, very few standards, very few uh, um, uh, common, uh, common vocabulary. And so a uh, credential engine uh, set out uh, to create that common vocabulary, to create a common platform, to create a way for uh, a library for credentials to be collected. So just uh, capturing the burgeoning credential market is one of the two things a credential engine, I think, uh, set out to do and was so appealing to me and to ACE. And then second is, um, is the, the growing importance and recognition of learner sovereignty. And what do I mean by that? You know, as we've gone through the pandemic, I think we've seen uh, learners, whether they are displaced workers, uh, single moms, returning uh, military personnel, uh, 18 to 22 year old traditional college uh, uh, enrollees. We've seen much more agency among those groups, much more willingness and ability to enter a marketplace of educational opportunities and to make choices that best fill their needs and help them along their journeys. What's unfortunate about that 
uh, is that that agency isn't coupled with reliable information, with trusted sources of uh, uh, information about how you get from where you are to where you want to go. That's always been a problem in American higher education. I remember back in the quiet days of the 1980s and 1990s that we bemoaned a lack of good high school counseling. We bemoaned uh, the lack of, of good, reliable uh, um, institution level data by which students could make choices about going to college. Well, uh, that seems quaint uh, today when learners, not just high school students, but learners are faced with these millions of opportunities that Scott mentioned at the outset. And so Credential Engine was in the right place at the right time and it has grown in its capacity to serve learners, to help institutions be clearer about their offerings and to help learners and institutions create matches that will best serve uh, the needs of both. And so when Scott asked me to join the board uh, after following Credential Engine for, uh, for a number of years and working with them as a key partner at ACE, it was probably the easiest yes uh, I ever made because I believe in the mission of Credential Engine. I believe in the power of Credential Engine to rationalize this growing marketplace. And I believe in this team. Uh, this is a team that is uh, humble. It is about partnership. And many of you who are on uh, the webinar know that through your experience. And I hope for those of you who have yet uh, to, to uh, sign on with Credential Engine, uh, that you uh, you take a hard look and you, you invite them uh, into your work. So um, that's that's my journey. And uh, Nicole, you and I seem to be on the everyday uh, uh, thing. Good to see you again this morning. It was great to be with you yesterday. Um, I, it, that was my journey. Tell me a little bit about yours and uh, the journey of the Gates Foundation uh, uh, to support Credential Engine and to really be, I think, the philanthropic leader in thinking about issues of, of uh, credential transparency, uh, credit mobility, um, ways in which we can create tools and systems by which uh, learners can uh, assemble an education that gets them from where they are to where they wanna be. Happy to, yes, great to see you again, Ted. Uh, thank you to the Credential Engine team for inviting me to this conversation. Uh, I personally have been very interested in credential transparency for quite some time, whether it's related to, as, as Ted alluded to, quote unquote, traditional higher education or workforce training and other programs that we're increasingly seeing uh, helping uh, provide credentials of value and other uh, benefits to a broader set of citizens within the US. To me, cred credential transparency is critical, especially in it for ensuring that more Black, Latino students and those from low-income backgrounds are getting given and using the most uh, up-to-date and comprehensive information that we can provide to them in making these critical choices about how they want to pursue education and put themselves on a pathway to a credential of value. Uh, and it's not just about the credential, which is one of the things that I think is so valuable about the credential engine work. There's also this component around the competencies, the knowledge, the skills and abilities that students are generating from those credentials that we really need to elevate and promote within our country as something that's just uh, necessary for us to ensure that everyone has an opportunity uh, to pursue the sort of uh, occupation or job that they are really hoping to attain, whether in their own community or elsewhere. I want to pull on one of the threads that you mentioned, Ted, which is around partnership. I agree that we as a uh, national foundation has have just been blown away by the ability of the Credential Engine team to bring together such a broad coalition of state leaders, policymakers, foundations, membership associations really in this shared vision about transparency. Because if we aren't providing young adults or older adults uh, with the sort of information that they need to make informed decisions, then we are missing out on an opportunity to uh, galvanize the field and spread the, what I think is a, maybe I'm a little bit biased in saying the benefit of education for all of us. Um, one of the other things that I wanted to point out here is that we've been supporting this great work for several years. And we know that connecting this information between state 
departments of education and departments of later, labor is critical. Without having uh, a more comprehensive and partnership oriented uh, relationship at the state level, we're always going to have two separate systems of understanding credentials. One that is focused on traditional Title IV funded education as, as Ted alluded to, and another that's thinking about workforce training. But at the same time, as I say to many of my colleagues, students or those seeking education, they're not thinking about this as a linear path that where they receive an associate's degree and then maybe they do some upskilling. They're looking at all of their options at once. And we as a community, uh, with the skill, with the uh, tools that we have available to us, really need to meet that need by providing this sort of transparency through the credential registry, through mapping of different pathways so that students can understand which particular projects, programs, et cetera, are going to contribute to their broader end goal of a credential of value. So I just really want to say thank you to the Credential Engine team for really galvanizing the field in this direction through uh, these sorts of conversations and elevating the and differentiating the fact that we don't just need transparency for one sort of credential or one sort of uh, state program. We need it to be comprehensive in order to put more information and better information into the hands of learners. I'm wondering, Ted, given that you alluded to uh, coming on to the ACE uh, organization with a, a vision on thinking more expansively than traditional education. What do you see as the long-term relationship between credential providers, which can uh, represent a broader swath than what has been, been the traditional associates and bachelor's degree institutions? What do you see as ACE's role in that? You know, thanks, thanks, Nicole. And I think you hit the hit the nail on the head and, and uh, you said it far more elegantly and efficiently than I did when you talked about the non-linear pathways uh, that, that learners are, are increasingly taking. And I, I think, you know, we, we've, um, we've heard a lot about the demise of universities and, you know, they're all gonna go away. And at first they, they were gonna go away because of MOOCs and they're gonna go away because of boot camps. And they're not gonna go away. And, and I, th I think one of the, one of the joys of life- agree. <laughs> yeah, good, good, thank you. Uh, my, my, you know, one of the joys of my current job is is watching and helping um, the more traditional institutions navigate this space. And, uh, you know, so I think that we're already beginning to see the layering of credentials and traditional uh, academic pathways. And I think that that layering is going to be key. And so one of the one of the roles, and we'll talk about states in a little bit, I know, it's one of the ways in which I think which states can really play an important role in connecting credential providers with uh, with state uh, community colleges, uh, state state colleges and, and universities, is by helping that layering happen, so that learners don't have to choose even if they're you know let's take the traditional pathway, a sophomore uh, in a traditional institution who decides during a summer or an off term or something else to pursue a credential in X, Y, or Z. Well, how can that credential be a part of the broader learning experience? And how can the broader learning experience inform the work that the, that the learner does in a, in a credential? So I, I, I see um, uh, time and space uh, being uh, eliminated as the real key variables in this higher education and more about presence and, and coordination as being the things that we're looking, that we're looking for. You know, it's, it's interesting, uh, we spend a lot of time at ACE, as you know, uh, um, working with institutions to accept uh, military credit around military experience uh, for college credit. Uh, we've been doing that for 50 years. And as, as we talked about yesterday, uh, Nicole, we do, we do about 500,000 transcripts a year that try to achieve just the layering that I'm talking about. Military experience layered in to a, an associate's degree or a bachelor's degree. And not everybody's gonna to wanna to do that layering, but we think that it's important for credentials to have that purchase in, in, the, uh, in, in, the, in the higher education system. So it's been, it's very exciting. Uh, lots of people uh, grumble and complain about it, um, but it's, I think it's really useful. Uh, let, me, let me throw the ball back to you. Um, 
you know, one, one of the, we, we, we both ha um, have these great jobs where we get to talk to lots of people and lots of different stakeholders. You and I can convince each other of the utility of this all day long. Um, but when, when, sort of when you're out in the so-called real world, what are the things that really make the most sense to stakeholders of, you know, a variety of stakeholders from state policymakers to higher ed people to uh, employers, job seekers? I honestly think, uh, you know, I may be a little bit biased. Those of you who don't know me, I uh, lead a portfolio around data strategy. And so I'm thinking about data all day, every day. And I think that a unifying piece of the puzzle is really the underlying data and information that comes with it. Because whether you're a policymaker, whether you're a parent, you're a student, you're a learner, you're have, you have the same questions. What am I going to be able to do in the labor market with this credential? Which credential should I be choosing? How do I differentiate between them in terms of outcomes and the value of that? And so I think that connecting this uh, overarching conversation around cataloging the credentials themselves needs to also include an understanding of to what end. What are we getting, you know, there's, there's a return on investment that maybe policymakers are, are thinking of. I don't think that learners really put it in those terms, but at the end of the day, we also know for many of you may have seen these surveys over the years, 80% of, of, uh, of pursuers of post-secondary education, whether it's uh, workforce training, badges, et cetera, any of the things that can fall under a credential, 80% of them say they're doing it to get a job. And if we're not providing them with the transparency around what they're gonna earn, how long it's going to take, what are the implications of transferring? To your point, Ted, about military credits or any learner that has prior um, learning information or has had a previous role, those are students who don't wanna hear that they need to go into Accounting 101 if they've been a, a bookmaker. They wanna understand what they can do to apply that previous learning to a new credential and degree. And so as much as I think that the conversation um, is really driven by ensuring that there's privacy and security protocols, we do need to make sure that, that we are connecting through more comprehensive information to students. I'm curious what your perspective is there, Ted, on how we get to something that's comprehensive across these systems uh, when we have something like the registry to build upon. Yeah, um, so, so um, uh, Nicole and I have a long, a long history uh, on, on this particular issue of data transparency and, and uh, integrated data systems. And so I wanna say, let me say two, two things. One is that um, this is a, a convening of, of leaders uh, who represent states. And, and so let's start with the doable, um, which is that I, I think as we followed, uh, I was involved in, in uh, the team, um, we put the college scorecard together in the Obama administration. And so we worked very hard to find the most reliable information that was uh, that was available that we could put it, put in front of learners, policymakers, educators, and so on. And as you all know, um, that that uh, uh, set of data is pretty limited in its utility, uh, and it's sweet. And so um, even then, when we were putting this college scorecard together, we were attracted to states that had figured this out first. And we're working toward creating integrated comprehensive data systems that allowed everybody, starting with the learner themselves, uh, to look at the pathways that they were taking uh, uh, to and through a variety of education opportunities and then into the labor market. And so this is one of the places in which I think states are in the lead and can continue to lead and where Credential Engine can add real value fast. Uh, um, now let's move, now let's move, uh, let's fast forward a little bit. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of debate around Washington about an integrated uh, um, national uh, data system uh, that would do what a lot of states are doing. It would connect K-12 data to higher education data to labor market outcomes. Um, and there've been some issues, uh, Nicole, you mentioned uh, security issues. Those are eminently solvable. And we have gotten a lot better at solving those issues. Um, the politics of it remain vexed. But let me say, and I guess this is the big reveal for today, that, that we at ACE support uh, an integrated national data system or federal data system uh, that would allow us 
to make the, the kinds of insights, Nicole, that you're talking about uh, so that we can, we can put the policy levers at, to work in the right place at the right time for the right groups. I'm gonna quick, quick uh, uh, return to the really important thing that you said about serving a low income first generation black and brown people. Uh, because I think uh, without an, a comprehensive uh, data system, we often lose track of the people who most need our attention and hard work. Uh, and I think that that is uh, point one about why it's so important to create these, uh, these systems of data. You know that that is music to my ears as well as the broader uh, foundation community. We have at the Gates Foundation been major proponents of a student level data network because to your point, right now the current system, if we think at the federal level and even in some states, it's not comprehensive. I know from the state perspective, you may have individual mandates that are related to uh, public institutions and you may have some aligned Department of Labor requirements as it relates to workforce training programs, but that doesn't capture all of the different ways that students are learning about potential credentials. And so without some sort of comprehensive system, we're really at a disadvantage to really understand what is going to impact and improve the outcomes for Black, Latinx, and students from low-income backgrounds, because at the core of our work and what I think should be the core of any um, organization that's thinking about education as a critical um, economic mobility driver, or lever, I should say, we need to understand um, how the uh, different interventions that we're putting into place are removing race, ethnicity, and socioeconomic status as predictors of success. And until we have something comprehensive that captures the disproportionate number of, um, you know, historically named uh, non-traditional students who are taking different paths than what is currently collected at the federal and sometimes state level, we're never going to get there. So wholeheartedly agree with that. And I also think that going back to that piece around the, the jobs and connecting this to a credential of value, we need better data, both in College Scorecard, which is how Ted and I first got connected oh, oh so many years ago. Uh, you know, lots of folks before that came out were really distracted by the perfect being the enemy of the good. Oh, well, we're gonna need all these codifiers and we're qualifiers and we're gonna need to push on this and it's gonna be politicized, et cetera, et cetera. We've now seen through now the third administration that has maintained the College Scorecard across both sides of the political spectrum because this information is critical regardless of your politics. And we really need to think differently about how we're serving our broader community. And in the absence of something that actually uh, can tell a student how much they're gonna earn, how long it's gonna take them to get through that program, how much debt are they going to have as an implication of that? And actually even going further, how do you compare that level of debt to what you're ultimately gonna earn, which we've seen through our value commission work here at the foundation, we're going to be at a disadvantage, both um, internationally and, and state by state. So I, I definitely want to acknowledge those states that are at the forefront of this. We know Texas has been really pushing on making sure that there's a broader understanding of how credentials lead to uh, better labor market outcomes. And the more that we can bring uh, workforce training, badges, apprenticeships, industry certifications, into the calculus of those outcomes, the I, I truly believe that we are going to serve our students much better. You know, you know, um, Nicole. I think you know one of the things that is really important about about our shared journey is that you know while we couldn't um, get it all the way to where we wanted to go with the college scorecard, uh, um, and it wouldn't be as good as it as it is uh, without Nicole's work. But I think you know you you have gone on and you've taken the spirit of what we really wanted to get done, and and you've drawn it into more different work, and I think that there is a there's sort of a, an alumni association of people who have seen the power of these data, and want to work uh, to to build the the network the credential engine is is on top of. You know one of the things that you that you mentioned about um, value for for investment. I just want to come back to it because. It's often forgotten that uh, this this is the all of the work that we're talking about today and all of the work that the credential engine is doing is a really unique uh, take on accountability. Um, 
oftentimes when we think about accountability, we think about state policy, we think about federal policy, we think about do's and don'ts and people who get off the, off the road, you know, can't get back on. And, and this is a very different kind of accountability. It's a public accountability. It's an accountability that is based on real, measurable, longitudinally tested outcomes. And um, those numbers don't lie. And so, you know, we have part of the value of, of Credential Engine has been to move the focus from the, the celebration of inputs. You know, the two of us could put together a badge to, you know, before the session is over and we would have no idea what its value was. But we could do a pretty keen marketing campaign, especially with the Gates people behind it. And, and we could sell it in the marketplace. But for a learner, the, the, the lovely sell is not the issue. It's what does that lead to? And that's the accountability that I think is, uh, is at the core of the revolution that Prudential Engine is, is positing for us. Nicole, where, if, you're, if you were um, the newly elected governor of, oh, let's pick a state, Missouri, uh, how, how would you approach this? What, what's the, where would you go with, with Credential Engine and the credit transparency work that you've been so involved in? Absolutely, yes. Well, um, one little side note on what you said first, and then I will answer this question about what individual governors can do. I just want to uh, you know, double down on this understanding or this change in our orientation that systems change needs to be learner-centered. Often the questions we ask are what the learner needs to do differently. And we tend to forget that we as uh, practitioners and policymakers should be held accountable to your, to your point, Ted, of how we're actually rethinking and delivering these systems and services in a way that is inviting and welcoming to the learner. And so I just wanna make sure that we keep that front and center because the things that I would suggest to any governor, Missouri in particular is great, is that to make sure first and foremost <laughs> that, that you're providing and building upon the CTDL, the credential um, engines, uh, trans, uh, tr uh, the credential transparency descriptor language, I had to get all those letters in because I'm so used to the acronym, making sure that every credential that you have um, approved for operation within your state is aligned to that language so that it makes it easier for whether it's um, uh, your own Department of Education or third party organizations to build tools that are uh, learner facing, that really help those learners navigate the different choices that they have available to them. So that's step one, which is just build out all of your credentials. Don't just focus on workforce. Don't just focus on what's in the Department of Ed because you're gonna miss things and the students and learners are not thinking in that same uh, dichotomy, right? Uh, the second piece of that is making sure that you're also uh, paying attention to the quality of those credentials. I know that this has been front and center and a real driver in uh, New Jersey, Indiana, for example, in grappling with if we adopt the CTDL and work in partnership with Credential Engine, what are the implications for what our policy changes or our offerings within our state are going to be? And a system like this, when you have everything mapped, allows you to really tease out the differences in particular providers and incorporate those sorts of reflections into whatever quality measures and metrics you want to put forth. I know that Lumina has funded a good amount of work in partnership with National Skills Coalition and other organizations. I'm sure Credential Engine has been part of that, that discussion because quality is the next piece of this in my mind, and we have to be intentional but we also need to start with the full picture because if you only look at the quality of associate's degrees and you aren't taking into account which of those um, individuals has earned a certification or license or is um, upskilled with a badge, you're going to make uh, inaccurate decisions. And so we need to make sure that we are bringing all of that information together in order to make the best policy decisions that we can. And uh, I don't know all the details behind the scenes in Missouri, so they may say, we're already doing those things, but and, I would and, say and just keep on keeping on then. <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. And Scott made the mistake of inviting two real um, nerds and geeks uh, to, to do this panel, but 
I do want to take a, a moment and, and put in a plug for, for CTDL. You know, in, in so many of these things, um, it does come down to the plumbing. Uh, and it's it really is that if you were to look at the, the map of what do you do, I think the, the, the uh, CTDL is the start here button on all of this. And it's so useful, it's so important, it really is a, it's 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 the way into all of the all of the things that that, that um, Nicole and I have been have been talking about. Um, we've got about ten minutes for some questions from the uh, from the audience, and uh, I see that we're up to one hundred and ninety one people so far. So this is good. Let's see if we can. You know, yes, people are nudging each Emily other in the hallways. Let's, 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 let's get over two hundred. All right. So invite your friends. Yeah. Um, invite well, your friends. Go down the hall. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you so much for that really wonderful conversation. I was just um, taking it all in. You shared a lot of really great insights um, and sort of pulling from that CTDL thread. We have a question in the chat about um, wanting to hear a little bit more about a global perspective, not just thinking about what's going on here in the US, but, um, but maybe how this can be sort of thought of or visualized uh, across the whole world. Oh, goodness. I have to say, as much as I encourage uh, us internally to break down our silos, I am uh, woefully undereducated on the international market in, in detail. But one of the things I think is critical about this is, first off, we um, should encourage organizations and states to not reinvent the wheel. There are some great international models that can be taken up. There's actually been a series of acquisitions across the data space that have brought different international perspectives to bear on how our federated model here within the US can take those lessons learned. I think that there are, there's actually probably better connections to the international approach to align standards and languages and formats um, within what a state can mandate and, and within their purview than what we could see at the federal level here in the US. Um, but I would hope that Ted has some specific examples because I, I, I will have to admit that I, I am, uh, that is one of my blind spots. Ha, don't I wish. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I, don't, I don't have specific examples. I, I think two, two things building on uh, what Nicole said. I think that uh, the, we talked about the student, student unit uh, record network. You know, I think that there are some uh, impediments that uh, the US, the federated system in the United States has, has created and perpetuated that leave us a little behind the more centralized systems. And this is not to say that we should adopt everything that they do, but I do know we had a, um, uh, 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 Nicole knows this, we had a, a meeting of um, my partner, uh, my peers across the world uh, yesterday talking about uh, you know, things that we should, we should be paying attention to. And this was one of them. Uh, and what was interesting is that um, in the EU, for example, um, they already have a very robust data system to be able to, to um, track educational outcomes into the labor market. Uh, and, and that comes in part because of the, um, the mobility of labor uh, across uh, um, national boundaries into a U uh, EU labor market. And so that's become a very interesting topic for higher education institutions. So I think in that sense, we've got to, we do have a lot, we have a lot to learn, uh, starting with issues of security. On the other hand, I think that um, they, uh, it felt to me and feels to me that the conversation that's being had in the higher education community is still about the transfer of credits and degrees across national boundaries. And they are far um, less insightful than we are at the moment in this just burgeoning uh, credential certificate um, marketplace. So I think that there will be a, a good exchange internationally as we learn more on the data side and they learn more about um, how we're thinking about the credential market. One thing I'll, I would add is also the W3C, the World Wide Web Consortium, which is an international community, does have several um, working groups that are focused on integrating or at least harmonizing 
the work that's under development in individual states and nationally within the US with what has been, you know, several European uh, countries at the forefront of really making, making improvements here. In particular, I'm thinking about the W3C verifiable credential. Um, we throw that language out all the time, especially as learning and employment records become uh, an increasing part of the conversation around uh, self-sovereignty, about credential transparency. And while a verifiable credential could be defined any old way, depending on who you speak to in terms of its technicalities, when you add that W3C layer to it, you are incorporating international standards into our work, which should make it easier for us to connect and take advantage of all of the great work that's already happened outside of the US. Great, thank Any you. Any other hard questions for us, Emily? Jeepers. Really I, I do have off. one more that is uh, probably not much easier. Um, there also has been a great sort of side conversation in the chat about uh, global interoperability. So i um, glad to have both of those conversations going on side by side. Um, the last question for you, and then I think we'll uh, sadly have to wrap because I think we could keep talking for hours probably, um, is that there's sort of agreement that transparency is important for current and potential students at all levels, but what's the best way to get data on outcomes, data like completion and careers and salaries actually used for decision-making? Well, I would say uh, one of the, the best places that's doing that at the state level from a voluntary perspective would be the Coleridge Initiative and their administrative data research facility. And I know that Credential Engine has been talking, especially with um, states like Indiana that have fully uh, adopted CTDL as their language across the siloed uh, agencies of how to actually take that metadata from the CTDL uh, mappings and, and incorporate Department of Labor uh, unemployment insurance wage information around employment and earnings. The great thing about the Coleridge Initiative and the Administrative Data Research Facility, ADRF for short, short, is that it not only looks within state at what those outcomes and earnings look like, but also across states. Uh, and one of the key examples that we've seen is out of Kentucky. They created a multi-state post-secondary uh, report that in the absence of information about their uh, three border boundary states, including Ohio, um, they were showing that one of their institutions had an employment rate of like 35%. And the school kept saying, you cannot be setting outcomes-based funding models on uh, these post-secondary outcomes around uh, earnings and employment if you're not taking a comprehensive look at where our students may ultimately receive jobs. And so after doing work within that platform, they found that actually their employment rate is closer to 87%. So I would say that that has been a great use case on how not only can you push on the narrative amongst policymakers of what is an under or overperforming institution by expanding the access that you have to information outside of that individual state. And all the more so if we have Credential Engine uh, leading the way in partnering with those states, you could start to actually connect that information, not just for quote unquote traditional degrees, but also start to look at the nuances with workforce training as well. Well, my addition I would make to that is to, is to remind uh, all of our state partners that states are, are huge employers. And that, and that using these data and using these outcome information in, in your own decision making about hiring up and down the, the agencies is, is, a, is a great place to start, great way to model it. So I think, I think um, Nicole, you and I should just get off and keep talking, uh, but it's, uh, it's great to see everybody, wonderful to be together. And I think it's back, back to the studio. Yes, thank you so much. Credential Engine is doing such great work so in this much. space. Yeah, we really appreciate your time and insights. And um, uh, we didn't get to answer all of the questions, but we will hopefully be able to continue the conversation in the chat and in our um, panels that are upcoming. Um, but before our next panel, I will turn it over to Eric Montenegro, our D Director of Communications. Um, who's going to share just a few of our resources and publications that came out this year. Yeah, thank you, Emily. I'm not sure how I follow such a good panel, but I'm going to do my best. But that was great. Thank you so much to Ted and Nicole. That was, that was amazing. 
And as Emily said, I will be sharing a few resources with you today uh, that can help advance our collective work towards credential transparency. Uh, we will be dropping links in the chat to all of these resources so you can have them handy. So please keep an eye out for that. Uh, but the first couple of resources I will share deal with understanding what we mean by credential transparency, why we see it as important work and why we need everyone to get involved. So in the next slide, we have our infographic, which depicts how different stakeholders can benefit from this work. And also the interplay of using data and technology to make a confusing landscape more navigable. So people, credential providers, workers, employers, state leaders, and so on, can reach their desired goals. And to accompany the infographic, we also have a video on YouTube that brings this vision to life. Uh, it goes hand in hand with the infographic in a short two and a half uh, minute video clip. We won't play it today uh, to save some time, but we invite you to check it out if you haven't already seen it. And of course, to share it so others can understand why credential transparency is a common good. These two resources are very helpful to get people to see their place in this vision and how it really all does come together. So in the next slide, I also want to talk about a handful of resources, some of which have come together due to a great state policy partnership we have forged with other like-minded organizations who helped shape the pieces I'm about to mention. I won't read the list of organizations. You have them on there on the side of the screen. But I will say thank you to all of these state leadership organizations, these experts in education and data advocacy for coming together to build awareness, understanding, and guidance for how state policy can integrate credential transparency into education and workforce development strategies. So the first resources I'll mention on the next slide is brand new, actually. We just released it earlier this month. Uh, in the next slide, please. Thank you, uh, this one right here. We just released it earlier this month. It's a quick one-page resource. It's literally one page front and back. Uh, that helps state leaders and policymakers again build that awareness right of prudential transparency and the need to advance and support it through timely policy but it also gives numerous examples of the diverse ways that states across the country are prioritizing prudential transparency and then using it to advance state goals so this way state leaders can quickly see why credential transparency should matter how they can support it through the things right here on the slide right they're using a common language making that data accessible and eliminating barriers so people can actually use that information and aid in decision making. On the next slide, we have our roadmap, right? The state roadmap, which is an action guide helping you navigate through the various steps toward credential transparency. Regardless of where you see yourself in this journey, if you're just starting or if you're off and running with it, right? The roadmap helps you move along that continuum. So you can see the steps you need to take to keep moving forward. And because we know that this isn't always, you know, it's not a linear path, right? There's, it's a winding road. We also have an accompanying toolkit, which is a web page on the Credential Engine website that gives you additional tools and resources for each step of the process. So let's say you hit a hurdle, right? You can filter through the resources that we have there by each step and subsections, and even by audience types, so that you can find examples the timely and the timely reliably fit your predicament. So we also encourage you to keep continuing to check back to the toolkit and use it along the way because we continue to update this with resources, right? So that way you can keep this uh, handy and it can be as useful as possible. And relatedly, on the next slide, please, our website has various success stories shared by our many state partners so that we can learn how they're moving toward credential transparency. So we can learn which agencies and organizations are leading the work in their states, which outcomes or goals this work has helped them to achieve, and also some of the next steps that they're looking forward to taking, right? So these success stories can be valuable insights into this work. And we also, like the toolkit, will continue to update them as we keep having more and more state partnerships come aboard. And as the work changes a little bit to keep highlighting the great work that's happening across our state partnerships while also giving you all clear and timely examples to follow. And on the next slide, this will be the last handful of resources I will highlight today. But there are a series of policy briefs, right, that we co-author alongside our state policy partnership team. And these cover and offer guidance on various topics, such as uh, aligning data systems from pre-K through college and the workforce, to quality assurance, 
and both the role of states in credential transparency, but also how credential transparency can then help states to meet their own goals. But I want to highlight uh, the equity loop, which is our third one in the series, right in the middle. And while all of these are excellent, don't get me wrong, they're all great policy briefs. I think the equity brief is important to highlight because it can get lost that this work has great implications for equity. States, policymakers, leaders are actively working to eliminate barriers that hinder the ability for diverse people to take advantage of their opportunity. And this brief offers various tips and state examples to inform policy and practice to meet these equity goals with credential transparency being at the center of it. Now, I know that Ted and Nicole mentioned some of this and I won't say much more because we also have a great equity panel coming up, but I highly recommend that you check out these groups. And lastly, on the next slide, I want to encourage all of you to please sign up to receive our newsletter. As you can see, we have a lot of resources and projects. So we want to make sure that you're all aware and are staying in the know about what we're up to, our various partnerships, and what we have coming on the horizon, right? So please sign up and remember to check the chat for all the links to the pieces I mentioned. And now I'll pass it back to our CEO, Scott. Thank you all. Thank you, Eric. Uh, and before we move on, let me just uh, once again thank Ted and Nicole for a great opening, for a great set of perspectives about the work that we're doing, how it fits into the larger picture that they're both so uh, keenly uh, in, in position to lead and are leading. Um, so thank you to them very, very much. So one of the things that we've been thinking about more and more here at Prudential Engine um, is the role that credential transparency plays in the equity conversation. And, and not just the conversation, but in actually helping to improve equitable outcomes for everybody, whether it's a 17-year-old, a 27-year-old leaving the military, a 45-year-old who's been laid off and is looking to get back to work. Um, we know that we have a, a more... Uh, a more involved role to play in that conversation. And, and Nicole didn't mention it, but one of the things that we're very thankful to the Gates Foundation uh, in supporting in our latest uh, set of funding from them is the creation of an equity advisory council for Credential Engine. Uh, that has just been uh, granted. We're just getting it off the ground. And we're going to be establishing this council over the next several weeks, and then spending about a year, a little over a year with that council to think through some of the uh, questions, some of the roles that credential engine, that credential transparency can and must play in order to create more equitable marketplaces and, and the greatest possibility of individuals being able to have equitable outcomes. We've got three great panelists who are going to be joining us today uh, and giving their perspective on, on this question and helping us really begin to frame the work of that Equity Council. So let me introduce them first, and then I'm going to give you a little bit of a setup for our uh, initial hypotheses in going into this council work. And then I'm going to ask each of the three of them to give their perspectives on the work of that council and what the council should be thinking about and the role it can play in helping to improve equitable uh, outcomes and equitable opportunities for everybody. So joining us today, we have John Lane. John is the Vice President for Academic Affairs and Equity Initiatives at SHEO, the State Higher Education Executive Officers uh, Organization. Uh, Alejandra Acosta, who is the Senior Policy and Research an uh, Analyst at California Competes. And Tanya Wallace Goburn, who is the executive director of the National Black Workers Center, and also, much to our joy, uh, a new board member with Credential Engine as well. So, a little bit of a hypothesis in, in why we are coming at this work and how we're coming at this work, and really trying to frame the work because it is a massive question, and we wanted to try and, and focus our efforts in a very uh, manageable way. So we are aware that, uh, it's our hypothesis, I will say, that individuals, regardless of age, are, are likely 
presented with different pathway opportunities uh, and are likely available or able to take uh, advantage of different transfer recommendations and their credentials to date might have different transfer values based on where they live, their backgrounds, their color, their income, their socioeconomic status, uh, a whole number of factors that are likely going to have a significant impact on the equitable opportunities and outcomes that are presented to them and made available to them. So one of the questions that we want to ask in this council work is how are equitable pathways and equitable transfer recommendations being defined and thought about? Not that we're gonna define them, we wanna understand what the marketplace, what this emerging work around equity is contributing to that understanding. And then most importantly for credential engines work, what are the data elements that must be understood and identified and made transparent that help us understand whether a pathway or a transfer recommendation are in fact serving an equity goal? How do we find that data? Who has it? Where does it live? How do we get that published into CTDL and made transparent? And then as importantly as that step, is helping to understand how that data can best be used by students and workers and others in order to maximize the likelihood of their being able to reach an equitable outcome, the most equitable outcome they, they can. So that's kind of the framing for how we want to enter this conversation with this Equity Council over the next year, year and a half. And we've invited our three panelists today to help us think that through as we're getting that off the ground. So John, I'd, I'd like to start with you and, and not to pigeonhole anyone's you know, current job and current organization, but SHEO represents traditional higher ed institutions and higher ed systems and states. So knowing that you personally have had a very uh, diverse and, and rich background in your career, I wonder if you can help us think about what SHEO's perspective might be on the question of how can credential transparency, data transparency, support and lead to equity? And what are some of the things that the council should be thinking about from SHEO's perspective? Well, thank you, Scott, and good afternoon uh, to everyone. Uh, I want to echo, uh, first of all, the uh, comment made uh, uh, that Eric shared about the richness of our first panel. I feel there are so many uh, wonderful perspectives, um, answers to some of the questions that we think about on a daily basis that uh, came from uh, our panelists there. Uh, with uh, our work at SHEO in our partnership uh, with our state members, uh, all 50 states uh, plus uh, territories in the District of Columbia, uh, credential transparency supports uh, states uh, higher education enterprise uh, as they respond uh, to state mandates around uh, economic development. Uh, every state has um, an economic development uh, aspiration and uh, whether that policy is uh, uh, provided as a mandate from the legislature or an initiative or a campaign uh, from the office of the governor, uh, the way that it translates uh, for our partners' offices, state higher education offices, uh, is usually uh, uh, that higher education supports statewide economic de development, specifically through workforce development. Uh, and so uh, it, with regard to the work of equity, it raises the question of what can be done uh, to help students pursue uh, their aspiration career pathways in a way that's consistent with what state workforce development goals are. And uh, some of the reality is that uh, what uh, workforce needs uh, express as requiring uh, in order to enter those career pathways, those change and they change constantly and students 
live uh, with the experience of pursuing one path, uh, thinking that it may lead in a specific direction or um, help them to achieve their aspiration uh, career. And by the time that they have begun the progression, um, either post-secondary studies, uh, pre-collegiate pre studies, or uh, workforce credentialing, uh, as they pursue that career path, uh, the needs for that career to enter it have changed. And then once you've entered, of course, the career path, um, you have to maintain your certification, maintain your qualifications. And so that can change as well. Uh, and uh, there, there are too many anecdotes um, about students at the point of completion arriving and then learning um, that the requirements have changed and that needs to be mitigated. I'm a big believer that um, all that credential engine and credential transparency at large can do to help to mitigate that um, is, is essential. Um, I, I think uh, state offices do well with the data uh, that's received from institutions, um, do well uh, in pursuing those important partnerships that Nicole referred to uh, in the first session. Um, with uh, K-12 state offices and local school districts, workforce advisory boards, uh, but also state workforce and development and commerce departments and state chambers of commerce, uh, so that we all contribute to that ecosystem um, that supports uh, the higher education's uh, attainment goals and its public agenda, uh, which also serves in support of uh, state economic development goals. So there, there's a lot to say about that, but for starters, uh, I think it's important. So thank you. Great, thank, thank you, John. Um, Alejandro, let me, let me turn to you next. Um, you know, I, I think a lot of the work of California Competes is really thinking across systems and across all the different players and all the different levels of, of providers um, in the state and thinking about not just one particular K-12 or higher ed or, or the workforce system, but how do they all play together to support um, outcomes and rich pathways and equity? I'm wondering what the perspective, your perspective and California Competes perspectives are on this question and some advice that you would give to this council as it gets, as it gets launched. Yeah, and first, thank you so much for having me, Scott. I'm really excited to be here on behalf of California Competes. Um, as you mentioned, uh, California Competes works at the intersection of higher ed and the workforce, um, obviously based in California. And so our goal is to have um, a state with regional uh, economies and regional communities that are thriving through equitable systems. Um, and so credential transparency is, is really part of that. And I'm excited to see the, the launch of this council because um, equity, of course, is important for anything, but especially here because we're talking about real world implications for higher ed, for the workforce, and that therefore for people's lives. Um, so having equity at the forefront is really just so essential. Um, broadly, I think that credential transparency helps people um, you know, go between systems, really look at the opportunities that are available to them. Um, and we can have some more co coherence between systems, as you mentioned. Um, right now, we don't even have that for traditional higher ed in a lot of ways. Um, if you take a class at a community college and you wanna transfer to a different community college or to a four-year college, there are difficulties there. California is doing some work to improve that, um, but it is still challenging um, in other states and across the country. Um, so even just there, we have issues with, um, you know, transferring classes and knowledge and experience to different systems that currently exist. Um, and so I believe that credential transparency is really a way to empower students and workers, um, edu educators um, and employers to make informed decisions about uh, what people have learned and what they can learn and really uh, facilitate some more movement between the systems that we currently have. Uh, you mentioned ideas for the council, and I think uh, it's a little cheesy, but true. Never let a good crisis go to waste. And I think this is really um, that situation here. So specifically with the pandemic, we've seen uh, a huge drop in enrollment in higher ed. Um, it had been declining already for several years before, but the pandemic really accelerated that. 
And so um, what that meant is that a lot of students moved from higher ed into the workforce, um, not for opportunity necessarily, but really to survive. And so through this experience, people are gaining um, you know, knowledge, experience in the workforce, um, and you know, not again, not so much for the opportunity, but for the need to survive. And so how can we take advantage of that as people um, start to come out of the pandemic and start to consider going back into school? Um, I think the council should really think about how we can recognize the work that students have had to take on during the pandemic um, and the experience that they gained as they tried to sustain themselves and their family in the pandemic and use that as kind of a lever, lever or the impetus to um, talk more about transparent credentials and how we can use credentials between systems. Um, how can these two ecosystems, the learn and work ecosystems, as you call them, how can they work together to identify people's skills and help them advance in their education? Um, another thing that I would suggest for the council to consider, although I don't know that they need suggestions, you have such a wonderful group of folks who are going to be on there, um, is to work directly or engage directly with the people who will be affected um, by credentialing. Um, you know, workers, students, educators, employers, um, having conversations with these people really adds so much color to these kinds of high level decisions and conversations and having them be um, at least informing the conversation, if not directly involved in some way, uh, is really putting equity into action. So I would say that um, those are the ideas that I have for the council and I'm really excited to see that this is happening at such a critical time. Thank you, Alejandra. Um, and, and it wasn't like I asked you to make the perfect segue to our, our next panelist, uh, but, but you have, and, and you, know, you, you correctly point out, we've known for quite some time that the, what we thought of as the traditional linear path through education has been breaking down and is probably now more broken than it's ever been. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, right? As you point out, you might be moving up through education into work, but then you may go from work back into education and not just into what was a traditional education, but into an alternative workforce program and taking all sorts of twists and turns. And that's the reality of our workforce today. That's the reality of our economy. And there's both good and bad in that. Um, and so, Tanya, let me, let me turn to you really working at the forefront of working with workers um, and, and black workers in particular, um, I would love to your perspective on, from, from the perspective of a worker thinking about what are truly equitable pathways, knowing that they're not linear and the opportunity to have the, the appropriate transfer value for skills and credentials earned regardless of where you earn them um, to help you move forward in the way you wanna move forward. What are, what are some of the thoughts that the council should be contemplating as we are attacking this issue and deciding the role of credential transparency in it? Sure, thank you, Scott. The National Black Worker Center really appreciates the opportunity to be part of this discussion. Our group works to end racism and discrimination in the workplace. And one of the realities that we know is that everyone wants a job and not just any job, but a job that provides stable income and fulfilling work. And in this COVID reality, when workers are saying no to low wage um, work, dead end um, high risk jobs, the need and promise of certificate programs that lead to quality high paying jobs are in high demand. By one count, we know that there are more than 500,000 programs ranging from dental assistant to Microsoft certifications, um, emergency medical technicians, web designers, medical coders, and the list goes on. This, these short courses are desirable in large part to their promise of increasing one's earning potential in as little as a few weeks to um, as long as a year. And despite the number of and the types of work-related credentials, little is known about how they are distributed across the population, what their labor market value actually is, or how people acquire them. They're like the wild, wild west of education. Some are run by industry, other by non-accredited schools, 
There's little oversight of their quality and even less is known about how many students enroll in these short-term programs, manage to complete them, pass their exams, and most importantly, land better paying jobs. What we have seen is that there is a predatory aspect to some credential programs that warrants oversight and regulation. Some of these for-profits disproportionately enroll Black and Latino students. They charge roughly five times the annual tuition and fees of community colleges and account for half of all student loan de defaults despite serving just 10% of all students. Um, in some cases, these so-called advancement opportunities leave most of their students worse off than they were before enrolling. There's also for us the, the matter of wage inequity. Men often earn significantly more than women who hold the same credential type. Men are often also likely to be employed, more employed than women who hold the same credential type. Men also tend to pay, um, tend to pay less than women to obtain the non-degree credentials required for their careers. And the Black community, we know that Black students enroll in certificate programs at a higher rate, but see even less value for them. And so what we would recommend from this council is what, what people have been saying all day today. And that is that workers, what they really need are credible credentialing options. It shouldn't be so hard to navigate. There's an intuitive app for everything. So why not this? We need transparency, it's been stated before, right? And transparency in terms of the full set of competencies for each program, it should be prescribed up front. And students should enroll in a single cohort program rather than individual unconnected courses. Remediation needs to be embedded, embedded into the um, program curriculation, um, supplemented as necessary through instruction that is parallel and simultaneous to the program rather than being separate or preceding it. And of course, flexibility. We need programs that are routinely responsible to the labor market so that students leave with the skills that enable them to get stable, well-paying jobs. And if I would add coursework that students can complete at their own pace and on their own schedule, even when cobbling together multiple gig jobs, raising kids, caring for parents, or even their grandparents. We can't say enough about transparency and, but I'll, so I'll add a little bit more. Transparency in terms of the program's list, um, length, their cost, the job skills that you will receive after completing the program, what are the competencies that are needed, what is the clear pathway forward, what are the earnings that you'll receive, and remove the curtain and disaggregate the data to show completion rates by ethnicity and gender. Show job placement rates, the types of jobs that will be secured. Basically, what are the employment outcomes? How has the student's income been impacted as a result of receiving the certificate? And then lastly, Scott, workers need an, um, assessments and ratings of the programs that they're considering. Ratings that are in one place and are, are as easy and as simple to read as a Yelp review. That that is a that that is exactly why we were created to uh, and brought into existence is to try and bring all that information forward, um, and and thank you. Uh, I do want to before I, I swing back to the panel for a follow up. Um, encourage everyone who has a question to please throw it into the Q and A, put it into the chat, um, whatever whatever you'd like to do, and we'll make sure we we ask the questions here at the end of the session. Um, let, let me take that, that great list that you just uh, put forward, Tanya, and, and ask the panel, not just you, but, but ask the panel to think about, you know, if we're looking to be able to have the specific data about pathways and to know if that pathway is equitable, um, you know, the, the transfer recommendations are there specific data points that you can think about that you have seen in various work being done around the country now that we would want to make sure are being identified and called out in the council's considerations? Because remember, the work of Credential Engine is not to define what um, an equitable pathway is. It's to understand how we bring transparency onto the various data elements 
to reveal if a pathway is equitable that, you know, the reality is, is that we may have different definitions of those things, of, of what equity is um, in, in different, different um, levels. So we wanna understand what data elements we need to be focused on and encouraging to be made transparent in order to, in order to support people's ability to navigate and to understand if a pathway is really gonna get them to those education and occupational employment outcomes that Tanya was just talking about. So, so let, me just, let me just go a little bit deeper with you. Are there data elements that you would wanna make sure we're really focused on bringing forward in this work? I won't call on anyone. Well, Scott, I'll uh, simply affirm uh, Tanya's reference uh, to race and gender. Uh, the huge theme uh, that's also uh, perpetual is, is the need to disaggregate. Um, and uh, I'll add to that one of the success stories I've seen. Um, anytime you can talk about um, location so that we frame um, the work of equity uh, by the parameters that match how students have been marginalized. So in your summary, you referenced that students can be marginalized by being um, younger than traditional, older than traditional, adult age, military, uh, first generation, ruralized. Um, there are a host of demographics. And when the data can match those dem demographics, for example, county of origin, uh, matching well with ruralized populations is one example. So uh, any anytime that uh, the data can match uh, the demographics that we're looking at that are marginalized to help frame the policy to discuss, discussion to lead to some solutions. I think it's a great first step. I, I, I will just say um, in, in follow on to that, and then I, I think what I heard from both uh, Nicole and Ted is you know just having the information about credentials and the competencies that are in them is, is not sufficient. We need to have also the ability to match that with student record data and the ability. So I, I, I heard both Ted and Nicole saying that having a, a truly richer national picture of student outcomes and of student records um, and being able to have the, the student unit record band removed so that we can really track individual, track is the wrong word, I'll take that back, um, to understand the outcomes and the pathways of individuals to know some of that disaggregated information by region, by ethnicity, by gender, by any number of other things, to know how certain credentials are, are benefiting different people in different places would give us a lot more information and match that up to the credential information but one, uh, one or the other on their own aren't necessarily sufficient to be able to, to do that level of work. Yeah. I would just add in terms of um, data and things to look at is how many um, students actually complete the program? How long does it take? And what is the investment of the, the learning institution and the student's ability to, to seek employment? So for example, one of the things that that we, we think about at the National Black Workers Center is when you are going through um, a credential program, a certification program, and this, um, the cost is a couple of hundred dollars, $400, for example, is the, um, the, um, the investment and in that student comparable to students who are seeking um, a, a two-year degree, an associate's degree, or a four-year degree, right? What are, what are, um, What's the investment that is given to, to that student? And then again, how long does it train, um, take for them to complete the program? What are the, um, the stops and starts along the way? And as I mentioned before, do they actually, um, uh, are they able to gain gainful, seek, um, receive gainful employment as a result of going through that program? Yep. Yeah. And I will add to that, Tanya, um, I think, two specific data points to look at uh, related to gainful employment, um, looking at regional wages for different jobs um, and looking at um, the opportunity to move up in a career in that sector, I think are two really important points for equity. I'll give the example of California. We have a lot of wealth concentrated in some areas. Um, and so if you look at 
at um, like an average salary in California across the entire state that is not necessarily representative of an experience in more rural California. It is not the experience if you are in a lower wage job um, in an urban area. Um, some jobs also don't necessarily um, have a, a career ladder that you can climb. And so making sure that we're not leading students or that students aren't going into dead end jobs as folks like to say um, is really important for equity too. So really, again, disaggregating things, um, not only by race, um, gender, income, et cetera, but also by region because across the country, things are very different. And even within a smaller area, things can vary a lot. Yeah, to, to that point, Alondra, um, and I'm just looking to see if um, my my board chair, Eleni, is still on, and, and I don't think she is, but Eleni is the uh, executive director of the Washington Workforce Board and uh, Washington State, and, and she frequently points out to people that, you know, what the opportunities are if you live in Seattle or King County are very different than the opportunities you have if you live in uh, Yakima or Okanagan or a different part of the state. That, that's a little broken down now as online learning becomes more prevalent, but it's still it's still the reality that the pathway opportunities, the employment opportunities in one region um, are very different. Uh, let me let me just take that a second, and I want to pick up a question that that has come into the Q and A here from from Joshua Marks, um, and thinking about pathways and and who defines a pathway. Is a pathway something that is predetermined and, and rigid and strict that an employer and an institution, a professional organization have defined? Um, or do we wanna think about pathways as constantly emerging and almost infinitely you know, permutations of, of possibilities? And, and I think if we were to think about equitable pathways and we applied the definition of an equitable pathway to a predefined, or as I have taken to referring to them, a poster pathway, those pathways that have been written up between institutions and employers and put on a counselor's wall and said, do this, 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 and this, we could have a pretty good idea about the outcome of that. I'm as interested in helping to understand and provide for a student, if you're at this fork in the road, is there an equitable pathway available to you if you go left? Or is there an equitable pathway available to you if you go right? And what do we know about the various opportunities afforded to you by either of those turns? And is there a way if you go left and it turns out to John's point, you know, you end up having to change midstream, can you get back right? Is there a path to get you to the right that gets you back in an equitable pathway? So I'm, I'm, I'm wondering just from your seats, how the council should think about what a pathway is and how we take that into consideration as we think about transparency and equity. I think that's a really big question, a little existential. Um, so I'm, I'm grappling- I was a philosophy that. major, Alejandro, I can't help it. <laughs> um, but I think it's a really great question. Like who does define a pathway? I would say, Right now, in the traditional sense, it seems like higher ed and workforce define pathways, but not um, in conjunction with each other necessarily. And then even within higher education, um, again, there's not necessarily agreement on different pathways or how you can go from one path to another. Um, so I think that's a question. I think Credential Engine and, and the council are in a good position to bring those two worlds together and through the conversation of equitable and transparent credentialing, talk about how can we connect pathways? Um, is this a pathway that is beneficial to people and to industry? Um, can education address the needs um, of industry through this pathway? Is there something that needs to change? So long story short, I don't have the answer, but I think that this is a very valid um, thing to consider in the in the council and start to break down some of the traditional ideas that we have about things to make sure that people can can get the the credit the credentials they get what they need in really in this new world 
And I don't have the answer either, but I think that um, flexibility is part of the, the equation, right? And so flexibility, that means that programs are routinely responsive to the labor market so that students have the skills that will enable them to get stable, well-paying jobs, right? So keeping up with the trends, having um, an innovation component so that we are always, or, or these programs are always being mindful of what is happening, what's the reality that's going on um, in, in the real world. The other thing that I know is important for students is to be able to have, you know, um, their, their schedules blocked out, if you will. So they're operating on a fixed meeting schedule that is consistent from term to term so that they know what their full schedule is before they begin and what will happen um, in order for them to complete it. That consistency is helpful to ensure that they actually could complete the program. Yep. And Scott, I, I want to uh, follow up on flexibility and, and being current and accurate uh, with a comment uh, that just appeared in the chat room a moment ago, kind of reverse engineering, gonna start at the end and, and work backwards uh, toward that. Um, and um, my approach to your question um, is a focus on minimizing cost and minimizing time to credential. Um, and um, it's something that we talked about. I think it was alluded to uh, in the first session as, as well, just a little bit. Uh, but for me, that's an important uh, standard uh, to talk about all the time when we're talking about the context of, of um, equity work or working through an equity lens. Uh, because uh, in any way that we frame the conversation around equity, um, beginning, middle to end, we're talking about um, students, um, workers, program completers, those who are in the middle of programs, um, who um, are already uh, confronted with some challenges that, that warrant the most efficient means towards quality credentialing. Um, and, um, um, you, know, you know, just bodies and populations of, of enrollees, of aspiring students and aspiring workers. Um, I'd, I, I've never seen for those marginalized uh, populations that they have the margin for error, the margin for time and the margin for cost uh, that non-marginalized students have. And so they really need this to work the first time. Um, they need it, um, you know, they need accurate um, academic advisement uh, the very first time. And um, what, they, what they also need is just minimizing surprises. Um, as one anecdote, um, especially in the, you know, professional fields, um, going back to Tanya's uh, earlier example, Students are graduating from some programs uh, that are labeled education, and then they arrive at a state's um, Department of, of Education, Office of Certification or Office of Licensure, and want to know what's next so that they can be teachers. And, and they have that horrible discovery experience of learning um, that this credential cannot be recognized um, for licensure or cert certification. So, they, so that's a system fail. Yep. And it's a system fail for someone um, who, who, you know, representing, you know, either a ruralized population, representing, you know, as a student of color or, or another demographic, they did not need that experience to happen. They needed some proactive, uh, robust, forward understanding and empathetic advisement on the front end and throughout the experience, and they didn't get it. And now they have all the debt that Tanya talked about. They don't have a meaningful career pathway to pay it off, and it, and it, it was avoidable. Yep. So uh, um, I, I see what we're talking about, um, you know, credential transparency, um, interacting with conversations and policy development uh, that are equity lens, as an opportunity to turn every one of the data points, which are human stories, into positive data points and therefore positive human experiences. 
I'll pause there. Thank you. No, that that was um, that was perfect because it, it not only brought forward um, a, a rich distillation of the challenges that people are facing, but two critical data points, time and cost, are things that we need to be focused on ensuring that the council is is identifying not shocking by any stretch, but the council's identifying and that we're then going to states and institutions and saying, if you wanna help people find and traverse an equitable pathway, we have to make sure that cost and time are at least two of the things. In addition to all the other things that you've mentioned today without, if you intentionally mention data points or not, you know, outcome data, earnings and employment data, direct links to jobs, you know, does this competency and this skill set lead to and match up with that occupational skill requirement? So many things that you, you've touched on today really help us think about what are the data points that a student has to understand. And then we go back to a state and say, we've got to make sure that the information about whether this is eligible for your state license is made transparent before a student gets to the doorstep and says, I'm here now, let me get my license. And they're told that, no, you took a wrong step five blocks ago. That's not okay. Yeah. Emily, I see you've joined us. I think you've probably identified a question in the chat that you'd like to bring forward. Yeah, I have. Um, and again, want to thank that these panelists for um, just sharing such wonderful insights and helping us think about our work coming down the pike related to equity and the Equity Council. Um, and it's definitely seemed to inspire a lot of questions from our attendees as well. Um, there are a couple related to work that institutions of higher ed are doing or, um, or maybe not doing. So uh, I think taking these two questions together, there's a question about whether um, post-secondary institutions in general are supportive of credit for prior learning, um, maybe some best practices that the panelists have seen in institutions of higher ed or good, good model programs to support students, whether that's um, remediation or other supportive services. Um, and, then, and then I'm just sort of adding my two cents in here, but maybe just from a broader systems perspective, what are ways to then support those model practices or programs um, and, and help make people aware of them sort of, again, transparently. Oh, Tanya, go ahead, I'm sorry. Sure, no problem. I, I did wanna, um, before I answer that question, I wanna respond to something um, that Scott talked about um, when he talked about state's responsibilities and the role of the state. And I would just wanna add to that, that the government has a great role to play in terms of protecting students, such as reinstating gainful employment rules, which ensure that students who complete career college programs earn enough to repay their debt, bringing enforceable actions to prevent um, programs from receiving federal student aid when it's been proven that they have defrauded or abused their students and hold the school's leadership personally accountable to predatory lending. So I just wanted to, um, to not um, continue without adding that comment. Uh, I'll say briefly uh, in response to uh, some of the questions that I think Emily was sharing from the chat room, uh, two thoughts come to mind. Uh, one of them about one of the best practices. I'm a huge advocate of the co-requisite model. Tanya described it earlier in her opening comments. Um, nothing nothing uh, is an impediment uh, to degree completion in higher ed, like cost and time to degree right on the front end uh, when you have uh, remedial or developmental courses uh, for which, you know, those 09, 099 courses uh, for which you don't get credit toward the degree. It bumps back uh, your coursework by a semester. If your coursework is, so, is sequential, it may bump it back by a year. Um, uh, and, and then uh, it's non-transferable, raises questions of financial aid support for it. Uh, it, it's a model that impacts low-income students and students of colors 
uh, disproportionately. Um, the co-requisite model, uh, Florida is one state among others that have done a great job of that. Um, and, uh, you know, when those supports services can be provided at the same time, um, others, you know, wraparound services uh, and um, inside and outside the classroom, uh, we've seen success with that. So I did want to uh, make reference, uh, provide some uh, more support for that, that point of reference. Uh, with regard to uh, the other question, um, are institutions of higher ed supportive of the movement to grant prior learning credit within their current structures? Uh, I think I would summarize that as um, mixed success or, or uh, mixed reviews. Um, uh, I've seen more of it in recent years, uh, both uh, at the national and regional and state level uh, than in years prior. Um, it's challenging, it's very complex, it doesn't answer easily. Uh, but with uh, acknowledgement of granting prior learning credit, um, institutions um, are weighing a number of factors, um, their own definitions of what quality um, learning and quality uh, engagement is, is a factor. Um, outside factors, uh, including accreditation standards are very real. Um, and, and then um, another reality that, that is discussed anytime the conversation um, is really engaged and you, and you get down to the brass tacks, um, accepting credits from elsewhere means fewer of your own credits um, that you are requiring for students. So fewer credits uh, means fewer credit hours of tuition. And, and that's, that's a reality. And so, and so uh, you know, with all the constraints, the financial strains, you know, it's, it's a real dynamic conversation when all parts of uh, campus come together and talk about these dynamics that uh, push and pull and tug on what's meant uh, the implications of accepting uh, prior learning credits um, through, through any means, uh, transfer credits, lab, you know, life experience, military experience. Uh, there are some really good models um, that I think need to be uh, celebrated more, um, but there are some real dynamics. So it's a real three-dimensional conversation. And I'd, I'd be interested to hear other feedback about it. So thank you. Yeah, I'd love to add a tad bit to, to what John just mentioned. It's certainly a very complex um, structure to try, try, try to navigate, sorry, uh, try to navigate if you're trying to um, have more credit for prior learning or, um, different types of um of credit structures because of one accreditation standard standards and two um financial aid and at the federal level um is largely or exclusively based on the credit hours so just there are some very real uh structures that are limiting uh folks in terms of pursuing these different types of um of degrees and programs but what i would like to add um is that yes john you're 100 percent right accepting credits from somewhere else means less money for your school and that is real at the same time i'd like to bring an example from prior work that i've done with uh, predictive analytics and bring up the example of georgia state university who use analytics and early alert systems to get more students to graduate and more quickly so that is also technically fewer dollars that stay in the institution because students are getting out quicker um, but that has been a huge success. And so I think what we kind of need is a few institutions to kind of lead the way and show, you know, here we are giving students credit for prior experiences and prior learning, but because they get through their degree program or their credential more quickly, we actually are, you know, showing the world that this is a good thing for the student and that could attract more people to come into the institution. So it's certainly a long game. Um, but looking at that example in a slightly different um, context in terms of um, early alert systems, it's not transparent credentialing, but it's a similar idea where you're kind of losing money if you're helping students get through school uh, more quickly, which is a, a weird conundrum. Um, but regardless, I think there's huge benefits to that. And I think we just need a few people to lead the way or a few institutions to lead the way and others will start to follow along. I, I agree with that, Alejandra and John, and I think I think it does come back to some degree uh, to the two data points that John mentioned earlier, time and money, 
you know, can you get through faster? And there are elements that, that can be described um, in CTDL. I, I need to thank you all um, and move us along because we have one last panel we wanna to get to. Um, I, I, Tanya, Alejandra, John, really appreciate your perspective. We are very excited here at Credential Engine to get this equity council up and running. You've clearly pointed out the rich conversation that it needs to have and it will have, both from the realities of institutions and policy to the realities of workers and students and learners in their everyday life, trying to make sure this works. We're really excited to dig into this um, and thank you very much for your, for your helping us um, to, to launch this work. Uh, I am gonna turn it back over to Emily now um, and she'll move us through to one more quick um, overview session about some of the work we're doing here and then on to our final panel. So Tanya, Alejandra and John, Thank you very much. Yes, thank you, uh, Scott. I echo your thanks to the three panelists. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Jen Brionis, to um, give, like Scott said, just a few quick updates on our work this year. Can't cover everything, but wanted to share some of it with you. Thank you, Emily. Yes, so I just want to, as they were saying, just want to take a few minutes to really briefly to provide some examples of credential transparency in practice from our perspective. So if we go to the next slide. This is the map of states and regions where Credential Engine is currently partnering. And as Scott mentioned at the beginning, we have 27 states and regions in total. And we're also partnering with two regional consortia of states. So the New England Board of Higher Education, and the Midwestern Higher Education Compact. Typically, we have at least one lead agency per state or regional partner that we collaborate very closely with, along with education and training providers um, and, and other partners to ensure that states and regions goals are being met. So for example, how does credential transparency contribute to meeting a state's um, attainment goals for, for its workforce? So definitely invite you to visit the link in the chat, uh, dig more into that state partnerships page on our website. And also wanted to point out that this map is interactive. So you can click on each of the states and regions um, to read more about what they're doing specifically and also view some of the key resources. I think Scott mentioned in the chat, uh, many of our partners have created credential transparency resources um, of their own from their own perspective and on their own websites as well. Moving on to the next slide, I wanted to briefly share these two examples from Indiana of how registry data is being pulled into tools and applications. So on the left, um, it's for those who already hold credentials, Ivy Tech Community College partners with Parchment to incorporate data from the credential registry to build digital diplomas that individuals can then take with them and share and really use to showcase their skills and competencies. So, it's really critical context um, that can be shown now in all digital diplomas issued by Ivy Tech. And then the second example on the right side is um, Indiana is also working on a learner and employment record pilot. So that pilot is going to utilize um, tools like the one you're seeing pictured here um, and we'll keep you updated as, as that moves along, but they are planning to use registry data and those types of career exploration tools as well. On the next slide, I featured um, our task groups. So the CTDL is a living language. We are constantly developing it to really ensure that it's reflective of the education and training data ecosystem. So these task groups are one way that we do that. Um, as you can see, they're really meant to bring together those subject matter experts who can provide that valuable input to help us develop our CTDL. Um, I put up our current task group, the credential approval list task group, and also some examples of previous task groups that have really, again, helped us uh, develop this language on topics like pathways. Pathways have already been brought up a lot and discussed deeply during this convening already. Um, and now thanks to this task group, we can really articulate and publish pathways data to our credential registry. And again, that's why our task groups are so valuable and just wanted to thank um, those who have participated here um, for, for doing that. And 
we will do more because again, the language is growing. So more opportunities for anyone who's interested. On the next slide, I uh, mentioned previously our work with two regional consortia. So together with the Midwestern Higher Education Compact, we formed the Midwest Credential Transparency Alliance or MCTA for short. And you can see the main goal here. Um, I just really, and, and as well as some of the strategies that we're doing together, um, launched that earlier this year and have had a few meetings uh, as a group so far, but I really just think it's a great example of how we've scaled up our partnerships at the regional level as well. And my colleagues are putting a link in the chat as well to uh, a web page where you can explore more of our resources that we've created for the MCTA, including again, we've formed a, a pathways action team. Um, so really diving into pathways in the Midwest as well. And then finally in closing, um, just wanted to open it up to all of you in the chat. Uh, Put your response in the chat over the next few minutes. Um, also, if it comes to you during our next panel, um, what else do you want to see from us? So you've heard now from, from a few of us and seen some of the resources that we've already provided and things that we hope to do in the future. So your input really does mean a lot to us. And many of you in attendance are our state and regional partners. Um, some of you are just meeting us for the first time. So wanna hear all of those perspectives, regardless of where you are on your credential transparency journey. And finally, just in closing to reiterate what Eric said that since our work is always growing and developing, the best way to keep up to date with us in addition to social media is our newsletter. So definitely stay tuned with that. And that's it for me. So I'll pass it back over to Emily. Yeah, thanks, Jen. Uh, as you can all see, we've been busy um, and plan to continue to be busy uh, into the next year and beyond. Um, so definitely stay in the loop with that newsletter um, and always welcome to reach out to us with any questions. Um, and I'm now pleased to introduce our final panel about state policy, which will be facilitated by Jeremy Anderson, president of the Education Commission of the States. Um, and our panelists represent three of our um, 27 state and regional partners. Uh, lots of really great work that they'll be able to share that's going on in their states and specifically how policy has helped move that work forward. Sean Sipersad, the Division Director of Academic Affairs from the Connecticut Office of Higher Education will be on the panel, along with Henry Mack, Chancellor of the Florida Department of Education, and Lori Fai, the Deputy Commissioner for Data Analytics and Innovation at the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board. So I welcome the four of you to turn on your um, audio We'll step back and let you have a great conversation. Oh, great. Thanks so much, Emily. And we're excited to be here with this great group. And we're really going to talk a little bit more in on the state policy side. And so not just on what has a specific state done, but just as much on what were the policy levers and the actions within either their executive branch or the legislative branch or the agency that helped to move some of the changes that they did in credential transparency. And so I'm really excited, as Emily had said, um, to have Lori and Sean and Henry with us here. And Lori, I think I may just throw it out to you first to um, kind of give us a little bit of an overview of the work that's been done in Texas. And just as important on some of the policies you've done, what were some of those policy levers that helped to make that policy change for you? Was it agency-based? Was it executive branch? Was it legislative? Great, thanks, Jeremy. And thank you to everyone, including my fellow panelists that I'm very excited to have the chance to talk with today for including us. I'll start by saying that we, uh, while we were at the, the beginning steps of our credential transparency journey, momentum that has brought us to this point actually started back in 2016 as a function of uh, a governor's initiative, the governor's workforce, um, uh, tri-agency workforce initiative that started in 2016 under Governor Abbott, which was aimed at really uh, aligning the three primary agencies in our state, the Texas Education Agency, our K-12 um, agency, the Higher Education Coordinating Board, where I sit today, as well as our work 
Workforce Commission uh, to align our work in ways that actually help to foster a more robust talent pipe and workforce for the future. We some some important legislation came out of that that laid the groundwork for um, and, and was pretty sweeping um, uh, changes and transformation in our public education funding approach. One of the interesting things that came out of that was uh, an actual uh, some incentive an incentive program around uh, for high schools at, who graduated students with demonstrated college career and military readiness. And so that provides a direct link into you know post secondary education and credentials. We had new charges um, issued in February of 2020, again, as part of a governor's initiative that have us uh, focused on strategies across a, a, a variety of things, uh, across a variety of dimensions, including things that won't surprise anybody on this call, like pathways and, and transitions and readiness uh, and infrastructure, which is one of the areas uh, that fits in very nicely with the with the topic of tra credential transparency. So we've been at work on those components in a cooperative agency-led um, undertaking. Now, in our most recent uh, legislature, legislature uh, earlier this year, we actually had some aspects of that codified into legislation. And so I know we'll we'll get into that a little bit um, a little bit later. Uh, the function of our uh, legislation in particular permits us to establish a credential registry. And um, while the legislation wasn't funded, uh, the spirit of that legislation is what we're using as our guide to actually take the next steps and begin our work to um, stand up to establish that registry uh, and, and create new and different types of visibility and transparency for what the what state funded training programs and post secondary education programs are delivering for students. That's great. Thank you, Lori. Sean, how about Connecticut? Give us a little update on some of the changes that you've made and, and what are some of the policy levers that have helped to make that happen? Sure. Thank you, Jeremy. And, and uh, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for inviting me. Um, uh, in Connecticut, um, there has been an effort um, with the with Governor Lamont to um, enhance our workforce in the state, and uh, they created a Governor's Workforce Council. Um, they uh, charged the Office of Workforce Strategies to kind of think about what are the best ways to uh, get the Connecticut population trained. Uh, and identify what are the sectors that need um, trained employees. So as part of that effort, um, <clears throat> and, and also uh, from the outreach of, of the regional compact or New England Board of Higher Education, um, came the idea of the credential registry and aligning it with the CTDL and with the work of Credential Engine as well. Um, <clears throat> so, um, we started this process, um, it was in part um, some conversations initially at the governor's level and with our regional compact NEVI to see how best they can implement this. Uh, I work for the Office of Higher Ed and we came on board a little later. Um, one of the more, not necessarily unique, but um, maybe special that not all states do is that our office was already collecting credential information um, from all of our institutions of higher ed, as well as our post-secondary occupational schools. So there has been some um, groundwork already for this effort. And I think, um, I think when this came up, um, as an idea to kind of enhance the work that we're doing, um, it was um, put forward in the legislation in the legislature, and I would say passed relatively easily because the legislature were all were already familiar with um, this effort in our office, and so um, so it kind of enhanced the work that we're doing. It expanded the work that we're doing. And um, and our office right now um, is is kind of working on how do we get you know the other pieces of information that we did not before, um, both from our current institutions and schools as well as 
from places that we did not traditionally collect from, such as the Department of Labor with their ETPL program list and so on. So um, that's kind of where we're, all, where we're at. Uh, the legislation has passed. I saw the note in the chat um, about it and uh, kind of gave us some, some teeth and some, some, um, some impetus to kind of get this done. That's great. Thank you, Sean. And Henry, how about Florida and some of the changes that have happened there over the past few years? Yeah, thank you, uh, Jeremy, and thanks everyone. Um, like many others, the groundwork has been in place for a number of years, uh, principally around our attempt to incentivize enrollment in industry certifications or skills-based learning, uh, both at the K-12 level and post-secondary level by attaching a large amount of performance funding to the attainment of certifications and work ready sort of credentials to the tune of over $100 million annually that flow to school districts as well as post secondary community colleges uh, directly to the programs that generate the money. Um, that then sort of morphed into conversations around the value of these certifications and how to accurately map the value to, uh, to what the economy here in Florida is demanding. Um, knowing that economic mobility in the United States without a post-secondary credential of value uh, to attain economic mobility in the United States without a post-secondary credential of value is difficult. Um, and that's demonstrably true, right? We know that uh, nearly two thirds of the individuals who are born into low income quintiles who attend college nearly always or for the most part reach middle-class status with a large portion of those reaching uh, the top income quintile uh, compared to only 4% of those that don't attend any college or don't have any kind of post-secondary credential. That then again has led us down the route of defining value in this context uh, and how to define value uh, on economic terms, but also in terms of what uh, the student may yield by participating in these programs. And so um, that's a very complex proposition, right? Um, and, and, and this past legislative session, uh, we passed a, a rather large transformative bill here in Florida, House Bill 1507, that not only um, uh, commissions the credential of value work in the state of Florida, uh, but also now requires the state agencies to partner together to develop the data infrastructure, rather really to improve our data infrastructure uh, here in Florida to account for how to map back uh, the outcomes to a particular credentialing program to then define value in this context so that then we can determine how much incentive funding can go to what programs uh, and to what students, assuming that you can build out this architecture, uh, which is what we're currently doing. And so this architecture now enshrined in House Bill 1507, or that is to say the development of it, uh, requires the Department of Education to work with our Department of Labor and our workforce system to do this. Uh, to do this well involves interoperable cred credential transparency and a cataloging of all that is. Um, <laughs> not just with respect to public post-secondary education institutions, but to everything that sort of is funded by either federal or state dollars for the purposes of training. And so the cataloging uh, is, a, is a necessary condition of establishing value. Value then is a necessary condition for determining incentive funding. And incentive funding is a necessary condition for driving the behavior, which can then lead to economic mobility for residents and economic prosperity for the state of Florida. Um, and so uh, we're in the middle of that now. Uh, we've contracted with a phenomenal partner, uh, a procurement here in Florida, uh, Perrin, Incorporated, who has convened a variety of uh, subcontractors, Credential Engine being one of them, to help us build out this architecture and infrastructure, not only from a uh, registry perspective, but uh, building in the value component, building in the ROI, and what we mean by ROI in this context, and building in the integration of the labor market information systems together with our own personally identifiable student information data uh, to measure uh, time to economic self-sufficiency. Uh, and again, this is all built in, built in. that was passed and funded 
uh, gratefully here in Florida that builds upon the work uh, that has happened in the past. And this has been led uh, principally by our governor, Ron DeSantis, and, uh, and thankfully the legislature uh, leadership itself. So Henry, you, you talk a little bit about establishing the value of this, and I'd love for all three of you to jump in. Um, that's not easy to do, and it's not easy to get multiple agencies to work together in the context of state government sometimes, because this is not a small one-off project. And so can you talk about not only the policy levers that you've used, but how you individually in your states have brought multiple agencies together around this? Because this is not something that in most states you can just pass one bill and have one agency make it work. It's right. very interrelated. Um, I'll start and then defer to my to the to the colleagues. Uh, one, how have we done it? Well, we have to do it now. It's in law. So that was one way to make it easy for us <laughs> to do it. Uh, secondly, I, I would really like to highlight the fact that um, the people uh, at my position and across the other agencies, we're all friends. We all like each other. Um, and that, that matters significantly to affecting large scale change. Um, and so if you don't have that relationship or those relationships in place, it's gonna be very difficult. Um, uh, so thankfully there are no egos in the room and we're all wanting to get it done. Uh, in terms of, uh, uh, and we share the, we share the mission, uh, which to your point, Jeremy, um, is critical for coming together and breaking down the silos that have traditionally existed between labor and ed. Um, to the, to the question of value, we're relying largely on the work of Gates, uh, largely on the work of Education Strategy Group uh, to help us think through a framework of quality, which relies on multiple economic indicators. Um, and then if a credentialing program does not meet certain economic indicators, like a wage threshold, let's say, uh, a middle wage threshold, or if a family sustaining wage uh, regionalized in the state of Florida for certain populations, uh, then the credential has possible value by way of its stackability. And we're defining what stackability means in our state, and we're operationalizing how to evaluate stackability on a credential by credential basis, which is, is not easy, as it turns out, to do. Um, it's a nice thing to talk about how, you know, possibly a CNA is stackable into an LPN, et cetera, but actually mapping that out and operationalizing it and evaluating it for uh, what stackability means in this context. That is to say, the extent to which that credentialing program can accelerate someone to another credential, which itself gets someone to that family sustaining wage. It's not an easy proposition. Uh, and so thankfully, Education Strategy Group and Parent are helping us do that work. Um, and again, value is gonna mean different things in different contexts. So I would love to hear from some of my colleagues um, about what they're, what they're up to on this, on this front. Yeah, I, uh, I'll just jump in. It sounds like Florida and Texas are, are uh, referring to similar playbooks because we're tackling some of those same issues. Uh, I'll go back to sort of what is it that makes the magic happen across multiple agencies and build on what Henry was saying. And that is there's a high level of cooperation across the leadership of our agencies. And what one of the things that we're working on right now is how to codify that in data sharing agreements that aren't dependent on the relationships going forward. So that it's, you know, that so that uh, a new level of uh, active cooperation is on paper and doesn't, doesn't uh, only depend on that high level of collaboration, though that is a necessary ingredient, uh, uh, ingredient I agree. Uh, and, and we're very fortunate in Texas that we have extraordinary alignment at the leadership level. And that makes the rest of the, 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 rest of the things possible. Certainly not easy as Henry's saying, but possible. Uh, the other thing I'll say is that we are at work, uh, I saw Nicole dropped in the post-secondary value commission work. We're also at work in Texas uh, refreshing our state's plan for higher education and intentionally expanding the aperture of that plan to embrace um, different types of credentials that have possibly not been included, that have not been included in the past. 
So really starting to get our arms around those other types of credentials that are provided. This is one of the places where the registry will be of critical importance to us. And that is for the same reasons that Henry was just saying, the ability to actually provide transparency on the value that each of those types of credentials delivers in the marketplace is of principal importance to us as we think about how to ensure that students have the information that they need to make the choices that are in their best interest. Um, when I was just listening in on the equity panel, I mean, what we see happens to um, particularly our, uh, our African-American students in terms of taking on debt and uh, either not completing a credential or completing a credential that is uh, out, is not gonna, not gonna allow them to actually um, uh, continue to service that debt in an, in an economically responsible way. Like those are the types of things that, that this sort of foundation will help us begin to shine a light on and actually begin to drive some, um, to drive some change around. So we're really, we're very excited about getting started though. I will say, I, um, I mean, it is a, it is a significant undertaking. And uh, while we've, while we have set aside as um, a meaningful pot of money to help incent our uh, our participants in the state to publish to the registry, it's it it will be a big lift. Um, sure. So, uh, in Connecticut, the Governor's Workforce Council that we have um, has really been doing a great job of connecting different uh, state agencies, other stakeholders, businesses and so on into the conversation um, around workforce and around credentials. And so uh, part of this, part of our effort has really been to kind of slipstream into that larger effort that's going on um, at the state at the governor's level. Um, and then, you know, along with that movement, I think one of the reasons why uh, we wanted to kind of build out a more comprehensive registry is that the states also uh, invested in kind of building a one-stop um, platform for, for residents who might be interested in getting in a certain career and then figuring out what are the programs that I need to get there. And not just a, a abstract kind of thing, but very specific, you know, you can go to this program at this institution um, and link it to a particular career. So um, part of what we're trying to do here in the state is, is build out that larger kind of user-friendly uh, interface um, that would be particularly helpful in, in driving, in, in helping individuals understand what careers they might be interested in and then what are the, the path, pathways and st uh, steps to get there. Um, <clears throat> and uh, uh, like I was saying earlier, some of, some of this groundwork is already, has already been in place in Connecticut. So for example, our office had already been pushing uh, data, credential data to the Department of Labor. They had, they had already built a, a system out to kind of do some of these connections. So that relationship between our office and the Department of Labor already existed and continues to grow as we're doing this work, particularly as we're also incorporating their EPTL uh, as part of the registry process. Um, and, um, you know, thinking about um, credentials of value and thinking about the work that the institutions have to do in terms of populating the registry, I think some of the interesting things that are beginning to, some of the inter interesting conversations that are beginning to happen, particularly for institutions, is around um, what careers does my credential lead to? Because now they have to, in the registry, actually identify those things specifically. And also talk about what, can I expect the, uh, the medium income would be if a student did a particular program as well? Institutions are, and now institutions are uh, beginning to kind of think through these things in more detail and, and try, to, try to figure those things out. And um, particularly with our relationship with the Department of Labor, seeing what data sets that we can access that might, that might help that process as well too. Uh, one final thing I want to say is that uh, the Office of Workforce Strategies 
is the office that has been charged with trying to figure out what the high value credentials are in the state. Um, and I'll just read, you know, they've kind of identified four criteria that they're using in order to identify what these credentials are. Uh, one is looking at um, if that credential leads to substantial job opportunities, what the employment and salary data is related to those, um, mastery of competencies, what competencies will an individual work with, and also, as Henry was talking about earlier, stackability. So we heard a lot from the previous panel around equity and the importance of that from John at Shio and Alejandro with California Competes and from Tanya with the National Black Worker Center. So can you talk a little bit about some of the policies in your state and is that aligned with equity goals that you have with your state? And are there areas that you would recommend to other states that they look at? In Texas, we have a long history, a decades long history, sort of like our colleagues in Florida and, and other places of uh, disaggregated data and of paying close attention to the, the success and needs of different populations within our state. Uh, I think you'll, as we are refreshing, so if you look at our state higher education plan today, it has specific goals for specific populations um, within that because we recognize how important it is for, for all to succeed. Um, and I, we will, th that will be even stronger in this upcoming um, phase of the work. I think what I'm particularly excited about that uh, I was listening in on the last panel related to is the ability to give students the transparency that they need to be able to weigh a proprietary program over here, a community college program over here, and potentially a third alternative, a four-year institution over here, all of whom are providing similar types of options, programmatic options, but may have very different destinations and may come at very different costs. That's what, that's what we're really looking forward to being able to provide um, in, in a similar way that uh, that Sean's talking about in Connecticut, direct direct to students, no matter what age they are, no matter where they are on their journey, so that they can uh, have the information that they need to make the best choice for them. Um, uh, here in Connecticut, I, I just give two two quick things. Uh, one is, um, as Laurie was saying, you know, providing information. Um, I think the more information folks have, the better they can make decisions. I, I think one of the kind of overlooked but uh, rising um, is the short-term credentials that exist yeah. that, that can particularly lead to, you know, really um, substantial careers as well, too. So um, I think our office has been trying to highlight the importance of these and on a on a state level, um, we just uh, or will be launching uh, a funding to to provide, um, I believe it's tuition, as well as some other wraparound things like childcare and transportation. Um, and I, I'll say that with a with a caveat that I, I'm not fully uh, connected to this, but this is my understanding of things that 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 will be um, kind of associated with this. And so basically um, to, to kind of encourage um, residents to, to kind of look into some of these short-term careers, but as well provide some of the structures needed so that they can go to school, they can get these credentials and then they can get employment afterwards. So these, these credentials will also have to link to uh, being able to find a job afterwards and so on. So um, really, trying to tap into um, uh, disconnected populations that may have had some barriers in terms of getting into uh, education settings so that they can uh, reskill or upskill um, and trying to remove some of those barriers so that they can do that. I'll be very quick. I think the aim around um, incentivizing the education structure to uh, support enrollment in credentials that are valuable, that is to say that lead to economic self-sufficiency or, or are assuredly pathways to economic self-sufficiency is directly tied to questions around equity and addressing intergenerational poverty and immobility for certain populations and zip codes across the state of Florida. Um, and we know uh, where they are, who they are, 
uh, and engaging them uh, is a condition of all of our prosperity here. And so to the extent that we can uh, be sure that the alignment exists and the return on investment is there, which is all part of this work. And to your point, I think, Sean, about transparency and more information for the consumer as possible is best in this situation. Uh, we're meeting those aims around equity um, uh, and access. Uh, and, and the last thing, I guess, maybe to note, um, this obviously, in the point of our panel, cannot happen without the backing of the legislature. And the legislature has to put money where their mouths are in order to make this happen. Uh, and in Florida, part of House Bill 1507, um, it establishes an open door grant program, which underwrites any unmet need, uh, right? So traditional unmet need, if Pell does not cover uh, the program itself, it will cover all the cost of tuition and fees. Um, but even for programs that are not Pell eligible, those short-term credentialing programs that can make all the difference in the world, uh, that's covered by the state grant, um, uh, especially the programs that may require adult basic education and basic skills learning, where the student, as a condition of this grant, would concurrently or contextually enroll in adult basic ed or adult literacy or high school equivalency and a post-secondary credential of value program. That's not Pell eligible, nor does ability to benefit kick in. And so there's a gap there to get that individual to the point where ability to benefit or Pell can kick in. And this grant from the state of Florida covers it, um, which is great, but that all hinges upon us understanding what a valuable credentialing program is for this population so as to ensure for the kind of economic security and independence that is a priority here in Florida. So I know Emily's mentioned in the chat that we're gonna be taking questions from the audience. So please, if you have some, put those into the Q&A section. And I've got one last question for each of our great panelists, and then we'll turn it over to Emily for the Q&A. But if you had one or two, maybe even three recommendations that you could tell the other members of this webinar, states need to do, what would those recommendations be from your experiences? You've each talked about some of them, but I mean, even if it's just one is great, what would you recommend other states take action on and need to, need to really move forward with? To get occupational codes on UI wage records so that you can directly tie supply and demand together and not in a you know, guesswork inferential sort of way, which is truthfully all we're able to do at the moment, despite anyone's saying to the contrary, they're not really doing it unless you have that linkage. We don't have that linkage here in Florida, but we want it. And we're looking to Texas to make it happen, Lori. <laughs> uh oh, well, uh, no pressure. Yeah, I would agree. That's one of the first and one of the most glaring gaps in our data that we, uh, you know, that we've identified across our three agencies that work together on these topics. And so we're anxious to, um, to explore ways that we can uh, cost effectively do that. Uh, and then start to fill in some of the other gaps that we've got. I mean, I guess my advice is capitalize on wh wherever your momentum is, right? So it, it generates from different places. It may generate from an advocacy organization. It may generate from a regional coalition, but wherever that momentum is and that level of cooperation and vision is, capitalize on that because that can begin to demonstrate a value proposition that can, that can gain increased support. Um, and, and ultimately benefit the whole state. In a state that's as large and complicated as Texas, you know, we, um, we have to think big, but act regionally. I, and one of the, one of the uh, other conversations earlier today was around the regional, regional needs. And I think that that's one of the things that we have to pay particular attention to in Texas, because what works in Amarillo in the Panhandle does not work in the Valley in McAllen, does not work in El Paso and may or may not work in in uh, Texarkana. So, I mean, we've got, we've got a little bit of everything here, and, but I would say momentum is a good thing to leverage. Um, I, would, I would start off, I mean, both, both in Florida and Texas, and I'm assuming other places as well. Some, it seems like this initiative has the support of the governor's office level 
and certainly if you are starting or or trying to get this work through um getting your governor uh, on board and getting the governor's office on board i think is helpful and then driving that through with legislation i think is also tremendously helpful as well um and you know just to build on Lori's point about see where your momentum is and build off of it i think state agencies are certainly interconnected with one another people know each other and building those relationships i think is is important in order to kind of get the information that you need. Um, and also, you know, in terms of building a registry, um, thinking about the institutions and the lift that they would have to do in order to populate some of these fields in the registry, I think is, I think is tremendous. And, and how, how can you get them to do that? Certainly legislation is one way to compel them to do that. But then, yeah, I mean, they just have infrastructural you know, limitations as well, even if you have the legislation there. So, you know, I, funding is certainly important uh, to kind of drive that process as well too. Well, great. Thank you all for um, all of the great conversation and discussion so far. We do have a couple of questions that I wanna um, see if we have time to, to get to all of them. The first, um, which had a plus one, so a couple of people at least are excited to hear a little bit more about um, how K-12 fits into this work. We've talked a lot about sort of post-secondary or post-high school credential attainment, but um, wanted to get your perspectives on how K-12 fits into this work and sort of the lifelong aspect of um, career and education attainment. Uh, I don't mind. I, go ahead. Sorry, Larry. You can you can start. No, Sean, you go first this time. <laughs> oh, I, I well, I'll, I'll say I don't have much to say on it, but um, in that I'm not I'm not highly familiar with the efforts that are going on in K through 12. I do know that the Office of Workforce Strategies and the Governor's Workforce is working with our State Department of Education to, and kind of trying to make these links. Um, Again, I'm not familiar with this. I'm just telling you kind of secondhand what I understand is going on. But um, uh, uh, certainly conversations have started around um, very early on in K-12, thinking of, you know, starting to introduce conversations and getting kids to think about careers and what they might be interested in. Um, at the high school level, um, they've tried to um, introduce, um, uh, automatic enrollments um, into the community college system so that, you know, they don't have to apply, but kind of based on their scores and so on, you know, they can get an understanding of, of, of what it would cost and, and getting into, you know, in those things. Um, and I'm sure there are other efforts going on, but I apologize. I'm not overly familiar with, with it, but those are some, some efforts that are happening. So it's not, I don't think it's on an oversight. It's just my limitation of being familiar with what exactly is going on there. Yeah, I'll say a little bit about what we're doing in K-12. So the the sort of revolutionary school finance, public school finance legislation, House Bill 3, that had that college career and military readiness incentive has put money on the table and made it really um, uh, interesting for folks to pay attention to what happens to their students when they leave their, uh, when they leave their, their uh, domain. So that's an interesting part part of the carrot. The other thing that agency's doing, and again, this is a place where we're investing significant gear dollars, is around uh, our agency is it, at the coordinating board is taking point on college and career advising across the spectrum. And so we are working very closely with our colleagues in K-12 to help put together a platform that that ex, that will that will work further back into the student pipeline. Uh, so that we are reaching back into the pipeline and helping make that a more uh, continuous experience and not something where there's an abrupt like point at which you talk about it and then you may or may not, you know, then your your diagram or your uh, flowchart branches and you may or may not ever find your way back. Uh, I think, you know, because of this, because the systems have grown up the way they've grown up um, as distinct uh, and sort of siloed breaking down those barriers is something that we're spending a lot of time across the three agencies 
um, working to operationalize, which is uh, one of my favorite words that Henry was talking about earlier. So uh, there, will, there will be, I think, increasing efforts around really trying to blur those lines. Um, one thing I'll mention in Texas, uh, 15 or so years ago, we had a tremendous um, emphasis on dual credit in high school. And so there was a tremendous expansion and support for uh, high school students taking uh, community college courses primarily. What that did was create access, but without a purpose. And so what I think we've seen is that we now have to begin to shape what's what the point of those uh, dual credit courses are for students so that they can, so that they actually have a destination in mind and aren't just taking random credits that don't really add up to anything and don't put them on a path to any sort of certification, industry certification, or any other type of credential that would uh, help position them in the marketplace for their first job or their intermediate job um, or whatever the case may be. Anything going on in Florida, Henry? I wouldn't have anything additional to add. I think the access without a purpose comment was spot on. Um, and uh, through Perkins, really, we're trying to leverage specific programs of study at the K-12 level, starting as early as the sixth grade through secondary that align to the credentials of value programs at the post-secondary level. Yeah. Uh, so the pipeline development is a crucial one. So I appreciate the question. Historically, K-12 has not traditionally focused on CTE. Um, and the traditional academic pathway is what, uh, unfortunately, I think is still dominating a lot of a lot of the, uh, you know, conversations as well as, uh, you know, environment. And, and thankfully, however, that's changing, recognizing that career advisement, career planning, and CTE coursework can begin uh, very early on. Um, so, yeah. Great. Well, yeah, thank you. Um, we do have a couple of questions that have filtered in throughout the day. Um, related to the role of employers. And so I'm curious, we only have a couple of minutes left, but I'm curious if you could just share briefly the role that employers have taken um, in pursuing this type of um, legislation and, and practice uh, in your states. Uh, they've been at the forefront uh, from industry advising groups for curriculum frameworks to employer validation sort of components or mechanisms for the framework of quality that um, that will establish what value means. So we are uh, reverse engineering it effectively from the employer's perspective since an education that is not tailor made to meet industry need is really an education without, to borrow Lori's phrase, an education without purpose. And so um, the legislation has been built around that, knowing that there is a talent war at the moment. Um, we yeah. need to be very careful and very attuned to how our education system is, is producing the kind of supply uh, the economy demands. Um, to defer to Sean or Lori for any remaining thoughts on that. Yeah, I would say that while there's been, I would say that our um, employer engagement has probably been most active regionally. And as a function of this refresh of our state's uh, really talent pipeline goal, we've had a much more active engagement statewide with employers to be sure. I mean, we're at the very beginning stages of really employer validated credentials. Um, and so I think we're going to be looking to learn from states who are further ahead of us. Uh, on really the most the most successful practices and being sure that uh, that employers are engaged in a meaningful way, not in a come once a quarter or once a year gather, give us some input, and then we're going to go off and do what we were going to do anyway, but really have them be engaged in a very meaningful way and helping to ensure that what we're doing actually does have the kind of value that that uh, it needs to have for their for their purposes. Uh, I would say in Connecticut, um, employers are an integral component in this whole process. So they are board members in the Governor's Workforce Council, um, and they are certainly ones driving some of the conversations around what are the credentials have high value, what things do they need, and thinking about how best we can we can get uh, the workforce educated and, and get them there. So um, I in the I, in Connecticut, it's certainly they are certainly an integral component and in help driving a lot of this um, 
effort. Great. Well, we are at time. I wish we could have continued all of these panels for longer because I've learned a lot and just really enjoyed all of the conversations. Um, thank you, Jeremy, Sean, Henry, and Lori on this panel and all of our speakers today. Uh, we really appreciate We'll sharing this recording and all of the resources um, after we close and uh, feel free to contact me. I put my email address in the chat. Um, you can find any of my colleagues on our website as well. So feel free to reach out to us. And um, again, we appreciate uh, everybody who is working towards credential transparency and are excited to continue the journey. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thank